Okay, hello everyone. This is Dr. Lyons once again, and we are in the third part of chapter seven, the, the chapter all about marine invertebrates. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to talk about two different groups, the annelids, which are the worms, and the arth arthropods, which are the shrimps and lobsters and things such as that. Uh, such as this cute little thing, this is a little shrimp that, that tends to hang out on the surface of corals. Uh, and I'm not sure what this shrimp is called, but I think, but I refer to it as the popcorn shrimp because it looks kind of like a like a piece of popcorn. So we're going to be over uh, in in this top part of the of of the the evolutionary tree that you've seen before. So we have uh, so we're going to be looking at these things here, the annelids and the arthropods. Uh, we have already gone through these groups, uh, and we are making our way across. Uh, going in the direction of the chordates, which will be the last group that we get to. Today we'll cover the annelids, uh, and then we'll cover the arthropods. So the, the annelids are what are known as the segmented worms uh, in the phylum annelida. Uh, and some things that characterize them is that they are bilateral. So you see this worm right here, it has a definite left side and it has a right side. They are all segmented, uh, and what, it mean, what I mean by that is that the body comes in individual compartments. So if you look at this worm along here, you can see that there's a, a set of legs here and a set of legs right there. Uh, and those legs each, uh, are, each belong to one compartment. And then next over here, then we have another compartment, and then over here we have another compartment, and then over here another compartment, and so on and so forth. So the, the whole length of the body has these individual compartments running, running its length, uh, kind of like repeating units. Uh, and that's what it means to be segmented, uh, is to have these repeating compartments or repeating units uh, through, the, through the length of the, of the body. So these things have a nervous system. They do have a brain that's going to be around here on, on this guy. Uh, and they have a circulatory system. And, and you can actually see that, this dark red line running along the back of this worm, uh, that is actually what's known as the, the I believe it's the dorsal artery. Uh, so that is a, a, a long uh, artery that runs the whole length of the body. So the worms, uh, they, they feed themselves in a lot of different ways. So some are carnivores that eat other animals. Uh, for instance, you see the big fangs on this thing, which is known as a sandworm, sometimes known as a clamworm. Uh, I've been pinched by these things many times because this is a common bait that one uses for catching fish on the east coast of the United States. Uh, and, uh, and these are obviously carnivores. That's why they have these big pinchers. There are things that are, there are worms that are passive suspension feeders. Uh, this, for instance, is what's known as a Christmas tree worm. Uh, it puts its, uh, these, these gills uh, that it has, these are the gills, and it puts those frilly gills uh, out, in a, out in the water and any bits of organic matter, like small bits of dead things that drift by, will get caught on the gills, uh, and that's how it feeds. Others are deposit feeders. Uh, this is what's known as a spaghetti worm. So these long things uh, are its feeding appendages, and I guess they kind of look like spaghetti. Uh, and essentially they eat things, they eat small particles of food that are deposited onto the seafloor. Right, so again, important distinction between deposit feeders, things that eat things that are deposited onto the seafloor, and suspension feeders such as these uh, that eat bits of food that, that are suspended in the water. So they, these things eat stuff out of the water, these things eat stuff that lands on the, on the seafloor. Finally, there are some, some segmented worms that are parasites as well. Um, we'll get to those in a minute. Uh, here's a couple of Christmas tree worms. Uh, so again, these are suspension feeders, right? So they put their, their feathery gills out into the water uh, and wait for particles to drift by that they can, that they can eat. These are also uh, uh, Christmas tree worms, again, doing the same thing. Uh, and these are what are known as feather duster worms because they kind of look like uh, old timey feather dusters that people would use for dusting their, their apartments and such. Uh, so these are the gills of them. Uh, and those gills, uh, like those of the, feather, of the Christmas tree worms, are used for uh, capturing particles as they drift by in the, in the water. Uh, so they use these things for breathing and for... So worms can move around, of course. 
Uh, and how they do that uh, is with the use of a, a couple different sets of muscles. So they have muscles that run the whole length of their bodies. Uh, so they can essentially constrict themselves uh, from front to back. They also have muscles that, that are running in a circle around their, their sides. So they're kind of these circular muscles that run around the body. Uh, and what essentially they do is by contracting uh, and, and releasing and contracting, releasing circular muscle and longitudinal muscle, that makes a, a small anchor that will kind of hold the body in that place. Uh, and then by moving the anchor or along the length of the body, that's how they kind of push themselves forward through the uh, through the, the seafloor or, or over the surface of the seafloor or, or however they move. So they kind of make this moving anchor thing that, that pushes them forward. So let's talk about uh, about a couple of different groups of, of segmented worms. Uh, probably the most important one to us are the polychaetes. Uh, because the polychaetes are, are nearly uh, nearly all the, the worms you find in the ocean are polychaetes, or all the segments of worms, I should say, that you find in the ocean are polychaetes. So there's about 10,000 species. Most of them are marine, like I said, and they feed in a lot of different ways. Right? So we learned about how this thing is a carnivore, this thing is a deposit feeder, these are suspension feeders, this thing is what's known as a fireworm. It's called that because if you touch it, it feels like fire. All of these whitish things are these tiny little glass needle like things. And if you touch them, they, they get embedded into your skin. Not very pleasant. Uh, and these things are carnivores. They also eat uh, that they eat corals, in fact. And a lot of the segments and worms, they have a really important role in, in getting detritus. So that is like small dead things out of the, the sand. Uh, and so I'm posing the question, has anybody seen something like this at the beach? Uh, if you have, this is essentially the poop of a worm. So what some worms do that live in the sand is they'll be deposit feeders, meaning that they'll eat, uh, they'll ingest large amounts of sand that has like small bits of dead organic matter in it. Uh, and essentially what they do is they poop out clean sand. So this is sand that's, that's been through the digestive tract of a worm and is now clean of all the organic matter that had been in that sand. Uh, and so with uh, polychaetes, the thing that makes them, um, the thing that distinguishes them from the other worms, uh, the other segmented worms, is they have these things called keats. So poly, uh, as we've talked about before, means many, and keats means, uh, means hairs. Uh, and so the, the, along the length of the body of polychaetes are many of these tiny little hairs, uh, hairs that are often called setae. So with each polychaete, uh, there's a segment, and each segment has a, a set of, of gills uh, and a set of bristles or setae or, or, or what we call chitae. So the next group of worms I want to talk about are the beard worms. Uh, and so this word is pronounced uh, pogonophorin. Uh, so, so these things uh, are called beard worms uh, because they have, uh, they have this, this kind of beard-like thing that, that comes out of them. Uh, and so there's a couple interesting things about them. Uh, so they don't have a digestive system. So they don't have any stomach or intestines or anything such as that. Uh, they're very simple in that way. What they do instead is they have these tentacle things, which is what you see here, these reddish beard-like things that are sticking out. Uh, and what those tentacles do is they absorb uh, organic matter that's in the water. Uh, so they absorb, you know, you know, sugars and proteins and stuff like that that's floating around in the water. Uh, and so some of these are, are kind of interesting in, the, in that they have symbiotic bacteria inside of them. So we've talked about the word symbiotic before, uh, and what it refers to is two things that are kind of helping each other out. Uh, in the case of, uh, of this relationship, uh, the bacteria that are inside of them uh, will take chemicals from the water and they use those chemicals in order to create sugars. Uh, those worms can then use those sugars and in, re in return, they give the bacteria a home to live inside of. Uh, so that is the, the relationship that they have. So the bacteria makes sugars using chemicals in the water around them uh, and the worms provide a home. 
Uh, and so these types are, are mostly found in the in the deep sea. Uh, I've never seen one of these myself because I've never been in a in a submarine to great depths where you would find these sorts of things. Uh, but they're pretty much only found in in deep sea areas, uh, such as what you see here. This is around a deep sea hydrothermal vent. So this is an area where there's really hot water uh, full of chemicals coming up out of the sea floor, and the bacteria inside of these beard worms are, are essentially taking those those chemicals and making food. Uh, food on which the whole rest of this ecosystem uh, is reliant upon. Finally, the last group of worms I wanted to talk about are the leeches. Uh, so these things are strictly parasites. Uh, and, and by parasites, I mean that they live on either the outside or the inside of other uh, invertebrates and other fishes. Uh, and what they're doing is they're eating bits of, uh, of skin, they're eating bits of muscle, of other types of tissue, uh, they're essentially eating the, the, the larger thing uh, very slowly. Uh, and so it's important to note that parasites and predators are different things. Uh, in general, uh, parasites are smaller than the thing that they are eating, whereas predators are often bigger than the thing that they are eating. So leeches have little suckers that they use for, for holding their prey. Uh, and kind of a, an interesting about them uh, historically is that they used to be used in medicine. Uh, so bloodletting is a was a common medical practice uh, in the in the darker days of medicine. Essentially, a, a long time ago, people used to think that uh, that if you were sick, it meant that you had either too much uh, phlegm or too much bile or too much blood. Uh, and so, what doctors would commonly do uh, is, if you were sick, they would surmise that you had too much blood. So they would attach a bunch of leeches to your arm that would then drain a bunch of your blood out of you. Uh, obviously, obviously, we know now that that's ridiculous, that that wouldn't help. Uh, but, you know, we're talking about the dark days of medicine before people knew about about pathogens and about bacteria and viruses and any of those things. Uh, so this is what uh, this is what used to be done back in the day. Uh, thank goodness. Now uh, we don't do that. I'm pretty glad that I don't live in that uh, in period. So now we're going to go from the segmented worms over to the arthropods. Uh, and so these groups are, are, are sister groups to each other. The reason being is that they both have segmentation. Uh, but the difference being is that arthropods tend to have legs, whereas annelids do not. So the arthropods are uh, noteworthy in that 75% of all animals on the earth are arthropods. Uh, the reason being is that arthropods include insects, uh, insects and, and you know things such as like wasps and ants and all the various bugs you can think of they're all arthropods and it turns out that there is a crap ton of them on the planet uh, if you were just to go to any tree in the Amazon rainforest and count all the different types of insects in it there would be hundreds if not thousands of different species of insects in each tree in the Amazon so there's a there's a huge huge amount of them uh, they include uh, arthropods, include the insects, crustaceans, such as uh, Eugene Krabs over here. He's a crustacean. Uh, it includes spiders and things kind of related to that. Uh, so what makes an arthropod an arthropod uh, is that they have jointed legs and jointed appendages. So the word arthropod refers to that. So the prefix arthro refers to joints. So if you are, or someone you know is suffering from arthritis, what they're suffering from is a condition that affects the joints, which is why it's called arthritis. Uh, and we've learned before that pods refers to feet or appendages. For instance, a tripod is a three-legged uh, object that holds up a camera. So arthropod means jointed appendages. Uh, and if you look at Eugene Krabs over here, for instance, you know that his that he, he can move his his, uh, his arms around, his claws around, I should say. He can open and close his claws. So there are so those are his appendages, and there are joints within them, which which is why he can move them around. Uh, all of the arthropods have a hard exoskeleton made of chitin. Uh, chitin is a is a hard type of protein. Uh, and exo refers to outside, so this is a hard outside skeleton, uh, as opposed to the skeleton that we have, which is a hard endoskeleton, an internal skeleton. Uh, and because these, these things, the arthropods, have this exoskeleton thing, it means that in order for them to grow, they have to be able to shed that. 
So in order for Eugene crabs to get bigger and bigger, he essentially has to, over time, get rid of that hard shell. Uh, and so what they do is something known as molting, where essentially the, the soft part of the, of the crab or insect or whatever uh, kind of wiggles its way out of its hard shell. Uh, and it's, it's then soft for a couple of days. Uh, and then it uh, and then it goes back to being hard. The, the soft part eventually becomes hard over time. Uh, and I have kind of a kind of a fun anecdote about that. When when I was in grad school, the the department that I was in, we had a fish tank that had local uh, fish and crustaceans and such in it from the ocean. Uh, and there was one large crab that kind of bullied around the other crabs. Uh, so it would, you know, it would pull the legs off the other crabs and like eat, you know, eat the legs of other crabs. And it was just a general jerk to the rest of the crabs uh, until one day that large crab had to molt. Uh, and so when it molted, now it is soft and is vulnerable. So what happened? All the small crabs ate the larger crab, uh, which I thought was was pretty awesome poetic justice that all the small crabs that had been terrorized by this larger bully uh, ganged up and ate him when when he when he was soft and vulnerable, you know. So so be nice to people that are you know that are weaker than you because one day you might have to molt and when you do they might eat you. Anyway, with arthropods the the body is often divided into a few different parts. Uh, so there uh, in a, in this ant for instance we have a head, uh, we have a, have, have a thorax and we have an abdomen and you can really see the segmentation there. Right, so we have a head segment, a thorax segment, and then we have these different segments here uh, along the, the abdomen of that. Of the... Uh, you can see the same thing uh, in, in this lobster here. Right, so we have a head, thorax, and then we have these abdomen sections. So first, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the crustaceans. So that's the first group of arthropods I want to discuss. Uh, and that's the main one that we'll discuss because this is the most of the, the arthropods that are in the ocean are crustaceans. Uh, so this is the subphylum crustacea. Uh, and so these are a lot of the, the shellfish that you would think of. Think of uh, like lobsters, crabs, shrimps, things like that. They are crustaceans. So what makes these different from other arthropods is that in general, they have two pairs of antenna. Right, so this lobster has this longer pair of antenna, and then it has the smaller pair of antenna down there. They all have gills, uh, which is why they're able to live underwater. Uh, in the case of a lobster, the gills are going to be underneath the thorax right here, protected by the, the thorax. Uh, and in a lot of these, the head and the thorax is fused together. Right, so the, the, a, a lobster, for instance, it can't move its head around because the head is attached to the thorax. Uh, so it's all one fused thing uh, that is known as the cephalothorax. And this hard part uh, that's covering it is known as the carapace of, the, of, this, of this. So how, how crustaceans feed is through a lot of different ways. So there are some that are suspension feeders that, uh, that are eating just bits of food that drift by. There are some that are scavengers, such as this, uh, such as this Caribbean spiny lobster. Uh, lobsters in general are scavengers, which is kind of funny because we consider them to be such a food delicacy, but they are totally bottom feeders. They just eat whatever dead crap they can find on the seafloor. But nonetheless, we think they're great. Uh, there are some crustaceans that are parasites. There are some that are carnivores that will actually hunt and kill live things. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that crustaceans survive. Uh, and in a lot of why they're such a, a prominent group in the ocean, uh, is because they have a lot of specialized appendages uh, that allow them to feed, allow them to swim, allow them to carry eggs around. Uh, by having all those different appendages that they can use in those appendages that can evolve, uh, crustaceans have really kind of filled in a lot of the, the, the available niches that, that, uh, that things in the ocean can have. Uh, by niches, I mean like ways of living, like things that you can do to survive. Uh, and crustaceans fill a lot of those. Uh, one thing about crustaceans that will become important when we talk about the barnacles is that they have internal fertilization. Uh, so they have they have sex, you know, just like a lot of other animals, including us, that you can think of. Right. So eggs and sperm have to be with each other. Uh, here's one of my favorite types of crustaceans. Uh, this is a picture I took in Indonesia. Uh, this is what's known as a cleaner shrimp. What it does is it uh, it hangs out on on uh, on anemones such as this, 
uh, and essentially fish will come by that, that want to get cleaned. By that, I mean uh, have parasites removed from them. So this little shrimp will go into the mouth of larger fishes and remove parasites from them. So this is a, another symbiotic relationship where the small shrimp gets a meal and the larger fish gets, uh, gets the parasites removed from it. Uh, here's another one of those uh, such cleaner shrimp living inside of an anemone. Uh, this one, though, has some eggs, which you can actually see it. So this is a pregnant female uh, shrimp. Uh, this is one of my favorite types of crustaceans. Uh, it's probably hard to see what's going on here, uh, but this is the, the, the one of the claws. This is another claw. Here's an eye, and there's another eye. Uh, and, and this thing is covered in all sorts of stuff. Uh, because this is what's known as a decorator crab. So decorator crabs, uh, they find things that are on the seafloor and they attach them to their shells. Uh, their shells have these tiny little hooks on them, almost kind of like Velcro. Uh, and I think you, you can probably all guess that the reason they do this is for camouflage. Uh, by covering themselves with bits of stuff from the seafloor, uh, it allows them to blend in and make and makes them very, very hard to, to notice. Uh, some of you may be may be thinking about the movie Moana. Uh, there was a uh, there was the, the the shiny crab played by the the New Zealand guy uh, Jermaine Clement. Uh, that character, the the shiny crab, uh, was based on decorator crabs. Uh, but typically, decorator crabs don't cover themselves in shiny stuff that would make them noticeable. They cover themselves in in stuff like algae and sponges and things like that to make themselves blend in. So let's talk about some of the different types of crustaceans. Uh, the first one I want to talk about are copepods. Uh, and they are noteworthy in that they are the most abundant animals on the entire planet. Uh, if you were to go out to the ocean, virtually anywhere in the ocean, and, and just take a, a scoop of water in, in, a, in a bottle, you would find hundreds of copepods. Uh, they are just absolutely everywhere. Super, super abundant. Uh, and these things occur. Uh, uh, they can be planktonic, meaning that they drift around in the water. They can be benthic, meaning that they hang out in the sea floor. Uh, there are some that are found in fresh water. There are some that are even found in the canopy of redwood trees in Northern California. Uh, so somehow a type of copepod evolved the, the specialized use of, of the canopy of redwoods. And so you find them there, you know, hundreds of feet off the ground inside of redwoods. These things, they, the, what makes them different from some of the others is that they have a super long antenna that's oftentimes as long as their body is. And what they use that antenna for, aside from sensing the world around them, is they use it for swimming. So they can beat this antenna back and forth and that propels them forward through the water. Kind of like a, like a rower will, will pull uh, oars through, through water in order to push themselves forward. Uh, and how these things kind of survive, what they do to feed themselves is they eat detritus, meaning like bits, small bits of dead stuff on the seafloor, or they'll eat suspended particles out of the water. So in general, they're, they're deposit feeders and they're, and they're suspension feeders. Okay, let's talk about the barnacles a little bit. Uh, so barnacles are very common on, on seashores like, like in California. Uh, and, uh, and what barnacles do, uh, is they is they essentially attach to hard surfaces. So like these barnacles here, they're stuck in place. Uh, they can't go anywhere, right? They're stuck right there. So they are sessile. Uh, they have these hard plates uh, all around their bodies that they that they use for for protection. Uh, and they are passive suspension feeders. So what they do is they is they wave their their feathery appendage in the water in order to to collect bits of food that that come by. Uh, and, uh, and with them, uh, probably something really noteworthy about them is that they have the largest penis of all animals. Um, sorry, that should say the largest penis of, not off, uh, the largest penis of all animals. Uh, and, uh, and what that, that means, or, or why that is, is because they are stuck to rocks, right? This barnacle can't just go over here to this other barnacle for them to reproduce. So the, 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 how they've kind of dealt with this situation uh, is that they have a really long penis. So essentially this barnacle, what it will do is it'll extend its long penis out of its shell, uh, insert its penis into this barnacle nearby its neighbor, uh, and that's how they copulate. Uh, and, and with barnacles, uh, they are simultaneous hermaphrodites, 
meaning that they have both, both male and female parts. So each one of these can reproduce with the other. They just have to have a long enough penis to reach their, their neighbor. Uh, in some barnacles, the penis is 20 times the length of their body. Uh, so just imagine that, 20 times the, the total length of their body. So it's not as if they have penises that are larger than like those of a whale, uh, but relative to their body size, they have pretty huge penises. Uh, so that's, that's probably the most noteworthy thing about, about barnacles and probably something you didn't think you would like. Anyway, that's that. Uh, so let's talk about the isopods. Uh, so, so what uh, makes them different from the others? Uh, is is that each of their segments are roughly identical to each other, right? If you look at each of these segments, it almost kind of looks like those of a worm where they're, they're pretty similar. Uh, so the prefix iso may, means the same. So all of their, their, their segments are pretty similar to each other and their legs are pretty similar to each other. So these things are known for being really disgusting parasites. So they will attach to the outside of fishes and, you know, eat their blood and eat their muscle and their tissues and whatnot. Uh, probably the worst one of these, uh, something that is truly disgusting, uh, is there is a type of isopod known as a tongue-eating louse. And what that tongue-eating louse does is it goes into the mouth of a larger fish. It eats the, the tongue of the larger fish, and then it assumes the position of that tongue. So now that isopod lives inside of the mouth of a fish and it, and it takes the role of the, of the tongue. It fills that space. So essentially any, uh, any food that that fish eats, now that isopod is right there in the mouth and can eat some of its food. So the isopod just spends the rest of its life in the mouth of that fish, just eating the, the, the fish's food as, as the fish is, is feeding. So pretty, pretty disgusting. So if you see one of these things coming towards you in the ocean, you know, make sure to close your mouth. You don't want one of these in your, you know, you don't want one of these eating your, eating your food and being stuck inside your mouth. Uh, I'm joking, of course, these things wouldn't actually go inside of you. But if you're a fish, you know, if, if there are any fish out there listening to this lecture, then make sure to watch out. Okay, another group of crustaceans I want to talk about are the krill. Uh, so these are what are known as euphacids. Uh, and the euphacids uh, are small shrimp-like crustaceans uh, that specialize in eating plankton. Uh, and what is probably most noteworthy about them is that they can get to be super, super abundant. Uh, so there will be billions and billions of these things that are about maybe an inch long or so. Uh, they tend to be in cold waters, and they are the whole reason why whales will migrate to very cold waters. Is is because there's a, you know, even though each one of these is pretty small, there's a tremendous amount of them here. Uh, so there's a lot of food right here for something like a whale to, to come along and, and eat. So particularly uh, the baleen whales, so things like, like minke whales and blue whales and humpback whales, uh, they will migrate to cold parts of the, the planet in order to feed on, on, these, on this krill. Okay, and then probably in terms of, of uh, you know, of ocean functioning, um, or in terms of the, maybe more in terms of the crustaceans that we know of, uh, we should talk about decapods uh, because most of the crustaceans that you would typically think of are decapods. So these are like shrimp, they're lobsters, they're crabs, things such as that. Uh, so these are the largest group of crustaceans. So they make up the bulk of, of the crustaceans that exist out there. Why they're, they're called decapods uh, is because they have 10 feet. So the prefix deca means 10, pod means foot, as we've been talking about. So each of these have five pairs of, of limbs. So for instance, if we look at this crab over here, which is what's known as a dungeness crab, uh, we see one, two, three, four, five legs there, and then one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so they've got 10, 10 legs total. Uh, of course, sometimes those legs are modified. So in the, you know, in the case of this crab, you know, its first two legs have been modified into claws. Uh, you see the same thing with this lobster. First two legs have been modified into, into claws. Uh, over here, you might think, oh, this looks like more than 10, but these actually aren't legs here. These are what are known as swimmer roots. Uh, these are the, the legs of that shrimp right there. So what these things do in order to feed themselves uh, is they're scavengers, right? So like these things, uh, crabs and lobsters in general are scavengers, eating dead stuff off the seafloor. Uh, some are carnivores. We'll get to one of those in a bit. 
Some are, are detritivores, which more or less means that they're deposit feeders. They eat just dead, you know, small stuff that, that lands on the seafloor. Uh, and in the case of a lot of these, the first pair of legs, uh, as I mentioned earlier, are often bigger and in, in, in then used for feeding or used for defense. So for instance, the, on, on the typical lobster that you would find if you went to the Red Lobster or, or seafood restaurant or whatnot, uh, is that the, this lobster that you find on the east coast of the U.S. has these big claws in front. Uh, and those claws are quite powerful. Uh, when I was a kid, my, my dad used to keep, uh, used to have lobster traps for catching lobsters when, when me and my, my brothers were young. Uh, and in the biggest one he ever, he ever caught, he wasn't very careful with, and it pinched him. Uh, and I imagine there's quite a lot of profanity, maybe not appropriate for the young ears of a very young Dr. Lyons. But anyway, I think me and my, me and my brothers apparently thought it was pretty damn hilarious, which is probably why my dad didn't catch didn't keep catching lobsters for too long after that. Uh, kids are jerks. So then, uh, so then with these things, the, uh, a lot of times the head and the thorax are fused, kind of like I was saying before. So on this lobster, here's the head, here's the thorax, those things are fused together. Uh, in the case of crabs, the abdomen is also fused. So here's the abdomen on a lobster. In this triangular thing here, that's the abdomen on a crab. So their abdomen and their thorax and their head are all fused uh, together. So you might notice that, uh, that with these two crabs, these are both what are known as uh, green crabs, uh, you notice that the triangle thing, that the abdomen is kind of shaped differently on the two of them. The reason being is that one is a male and one is a female. Uh, and so the females are the ones that carry eggs and they carry it in their abdomen. So then you could probably guess that the female is this one down here. It's got a wider abdomen, which allows it to carry those eggs. Whereas the male doesn't need to have a wide abdomen because it doesn't need to carry them around. So sometimes, uh, in, and I've found this many times myself, have found crabs that have uh, females that have a, a pouch of eggs essentially uh, underneath the abdomen here. Uh, and I've seen this on lobsters as well. Female lobsters will carry eggs uh, underneath, uh, underneath the, the abdomen. Uh, to go back to that story I was telling a minute ago about, about the lobster that pinched my, my dad's finger when I was a young kid, uh, that lobster was a female and had a bunch of eggs, meaning that he couldn't even eat the lobster. When you catch, in general, when you catch lobsters that have eggs, you're, you're required by law to, to let them go. So, so I think that was a pretty bad day for, for my dad's career as a lobster fisherman because he got pinched, his kids laughed at him, and it wasn't even a lobster that he could, that he could, uh, that he could keep. Okay, uh, there's a couple, of, a couple of different types of decapods I wanted to talk about specifically because they have interesting features. Uh, pistol shrimps are definitely one of these. Uh, so with this shrimp here, you can see that it's got one large claw and then one smaller claw. Uh, and so what that one large claw does is it kind of fires what's known as a bubble bullet. So it will kind of snap this claw back and snap it shut at super, super fast speeds. Uh, and by doing so, it, it, it releases so much energy that it, it sends this little kind of bubble bullet uh, that it uses to stun its prey. Uh, so these pistol shrimp, in a way, they, they kind of shoot their, their prey. So they use it to kind of shoot and to, and to decapitate their, 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 or incapacitate their, their prey. Uh, another thing that, that these pistol shrimp are known for that, I, that is pretty near and dear to me uh, is that they have mutualisms with larger fish. So what's going on here is you see a pistol shrimp down here, and up here is a larger fish known as a goby fish. Uh, and what happens is this pistol shrimp is really good at making a hole in the sand. So there's a hole like burrow underneath here that, that, that it can hide inside when there are predators around. Uh, however, this shrimp, you're looking at it and you're not really seeing any eyes. Uh, and the reason is because they're evolved for a below ground lifestyle. So they have lost their eyes and lost their vision. So anytime this shrimp comes out of its little hole uh, to feed or to, or to push sand out of the hole, uh, essentially it's vulnerable to predators because it cannot see them coming. So that's where the fish comes into place. Uh, so the fish has these big eyes, which you can see. Uh, and what that fish does is it acts as a lookout for this smaller shrimp. Uh, so anytime there is a predator outside, uh, this fish will kind of wave its little tail back and forth. Uh, and the shrimp 
has its antenna on the tail of the fish, as you can see there. So if it feels the fish waving its little tail back and forth, the shrimp knows that it better get back in the burrow, otherwise it's gonna get eaten. So the shrimp makes a, makes a little burrow in the sand, uh, and, and it allows this fish to live in the burrow, so they're kind of roommates. And what the fish provides in return is a warning signal for when there are predators around. Uh, so this is a, a classic example of a mutualism or, or a symbiosis uh, where they're trading two different benefits, right? So there's protection that the, that the fish provides is being uh, exchanged for a home which the shrimp provides. Uh, and this is really near and dear to me because this is actually what I studied my, my PhD on. So I've spent hours and hours and hours uh, watching these things and kind of working out the relationship between these things. Okay, so a lot of arthropods are of, uh, in decapods specifically, are of a lot of commercial importance. So what you're looking at here, this is what's known as the California spiny lobster. Uh, they, they don't get quite as big as the, the like American lobster that you find on the East Coast, but nonetheless, they're, they're relatively big, pretty tasty lobsters. Uh, and so I want you to think about what sort of economic impact this lobster might have. Right, so how much money do you think the the, lobster, the spiny lobster fishery might generate in California each year? Right, so like how much money is made uh, by people going out and catching these things? Uh, and so the number is roughly uh, it's somewhere on the order of like 50 to 60 million dollars per year. So the commercial fishery, meaning meaning professional fishermen like professional commercial lobster fishermen, uh, will go out and they and they catch. Uh, they catch lobsters and they sell them to, to you know, to markets. Uh, and that generates somewhere around $20 million a year. In the recreational fishery, meaning just regular people like you and me, not, not, not professional fishers, uh, people like us going out and catching these things generate something between 30 and $40 million per year, right? So actually a pretty important fishery on the... On okay, one last type of... Uh, of crustacean that I wanted to talk about are the mantis shrimp. Uh, and so if you were a small crab, this would, this sight of this thing would strike terror in your, in your heart. The reason being is that mantis shrimp, uh, they are really, really effective predators. Uh, so why they're so effective is first of all, they've got really crazy vision. So they have, uh, they, they can see more color than us. The reason being is that they have an extra set of cones that we don't have. So inside of your eyeball and your retina, there are rods and cones. Rods and cones are the cells that your, that your eyes use to detect light. And cones are the types of cells that are used for, for detecting color. Uh, in the case of a, of a mantis shrimp, uh, they, can, uh, they have more types of cones than we do, so they can see more light than we can. Uh, on top of that, they can move these eyeballs all around in all directions. So they can see around them really, really well. Uh, so that's pretty cool. But then the thing that makes mantis shrimp really different from a lot of other type of crustaceans uh, is how they actually, uh, you know, kill their prey. Uh, so here and there, they have these claws that are modified into little boxing gloves. So essentially what they do is they corner their prey and they just beat the crap out of it. Uh, so imagine like Mike Tyson just beating the crap out of like some poor like defenseless like little person. Uh, this is what uh, these things do. They are they are mean bullies that just beat the crap out of their prey and then uh, and then eat their eat their prey. So like I said, if you're a small crab, you would want to avoid uh, these things. Uh, as far as we go, you know these things are no longer than a foot, so they're not really a uh, a big threat to us. Okay. So there is one other type of marine arthropod that I want to talk about a little bit, uh, and it's these uh, kind of interesting things. Uh, so these are what are known as horseshoe crabs. Uh, so they are a completely different group from the crustaceans. So they're, they're not crustaceans. They're actually uh, more closely related to things like spiders and ticks and scorpions and things like that. So this is the, the class uh, Meristomata. Uh, and, uh, and some important things about them is that, first of all, they are not true crabs. So like Eugene crabs, he is a true crab. He's a decapod crab of the crustacean group of arthropods. Whereas these things are not that, they are not true crabs. Uh, like I was saying before, they're more closely related to spiders and, and ticks. So probably the, the most interesting thing about these things is that they are old. 
so this is a fossil of a horseshoe crab. Uh, and you can see that this fossil looks pretty similar to what they look like now. So these things have been around for a very long time, some, somewhere around 450 million years. Uh, and over that entire period of time, they have stayed relatively unchanged. Right, so they've had pretty much the same exact shape and lifestyle that they had 450 million years ago. So they have just they have this really simple but really effective way of, of living. Uh, and they've just kind of stuck with that for a long period of time. Right, so these things go back, you know, longer than sharks, longer than dinosaurs. And, and in that whole time, uh, they've stayed unchanged. So these things, uh, you're not going to be able to see one over here because uh, in California, we don't have them. Uh, the nearest place where you would see one of these is on the east coast of the U.S. So where I grew up uh, near Boston, I would see tons and tons of these when I was a kid. Uh, and you'd see them on the shoreline kind of clambering around kind of kind of like this. Uh, when you see them all kind of piled up like this, essentially is what's going on is it's reproduction time. Uh, so these are all males and females that have all clambered up on the beach and they're all getting ready to reproduce. So how these things uh, feed themselves is they're scavengers, so they just eat whatever you know dead stuff they can find on the on the seafloor. Yeah, so those are ho the horseshoe crabs, uh, and that's pretty much all I've got to tell you about the annelids and the arthropods. So in the the next chapter, we'll get into the last groups of of invertebrates. So we'll talk about the uh, the echinoderms, and then we'll get into the the chordates that don't have a backbone.